Have you ever seen someone do something nice, maybe even heroic, just for the sake of his own selfish gain? Maybe even you've found your own behavior to be often motivated by self-regarding concern. You don't really care to talk to your parents this weekend, but you know you should call them because they'll be mad at you, which will be very unpleasant if you don't call. You lend your neighbor a few eggs and some sugar, not because you think it's just good to be generous, but because you know that at some point in the future, you'll probably be short on similar items. So lending these things out now will eventually be reciprocated, and you'll be able to get what's yours when you need it. Or maybe you have a cat like me who you just love so much and care for deeply, but not for his own sake, but rather because you think he's just so darn cute and you get so much pleasure from caring for him. The more pervasive these kinds of motivations are, the more we might worry about the reasonableness of much of morality. You see, the more natural it is for us to act on self-concern or be motivated by it, and the more difficult it is for us to act for the sake of others, then the more demanding and potentially unreasonable become the dictates of morality. In the extreme case, if humans are always motivated by selfish concern, even in seemingly generous and kind acts, then it seems like there could in fact be no real morality at all, since morality can't demand what's impossible of us, And we often think that morality demands that we act directly for the sake of others, not our own sake. If we can never act for the sake of others, again, considering this extreme case, because all of our acts are motivated by self-concern, then many of the moral duties that we commonly assume ourselves to have would in fact not be duties at all. Altruism, the desire to benefit others directly and for their own sake, could never be required of us by morality. It would literally be impossible to be altruistic. This extreme case has a name in philosophy. It's called psychological egoism. I hope it's not selfish of me to welcome you to Philosophy Jam and today's lecture, where we'll explore this thesis of psychological egoism and its ethical counterpart, ethical egoism. It's important to keep in mind that psychological egoism is a purely descriptive view. It says nothing about whether it is good or bad that we are motivated by self-regarding desire, and concern. Rather, it says simply that we are motivated in this way. There's a famous story that helps illustrate the thesis. I first came across it in the wonderful introductory ethics textbook, The Elements of Ethics by James Rachels. Story goes like this. Abraham Lincoln and a friend are riding in a horse-drawn wagon and having an argument about psychological egoism, whether all human actions are motivated by self-concern. Eventually, they come across a sow brooding over her piglets, who seem to be caught in a swamp, drowning. Lincoln jumps out of the wagon and rescues the pigs. When he gets back into the wagon, his friend says that surely... Lincoln's actions there were a clear refutation of psychological egoism. 
he acted out of regard for the pigs, not for himself. Lincoln replies, quote, why, bless your soul, that was the very essence of selfishness. I should have had no peace of mind all day had I gone on and left that suffering old sow worrying over those pigs. I did it to get peace of mind, don't you see? Here's a different example of this kind of debate in popular culture. Hey. Oh, no, 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 vomit tux. no, no, vomit tux. <laughs> Don't worry, I had it dry clean. Vomit tux? Who vomited on... You know what? What'd you up to, Joe? Well, I'm doing this uh, telethon thing on TV, and my agent got me a job as co-host. Oh, that's hey, great. Yeah, a little uh, good deed for PBS, plus some TV exposure. Now, that's the kind of math Joey likes to do. <laughs> oh, PBS. What's wrong with PBS? Oh, what's right with them? Why don't you like PBS, Phoebs? Okay, because right after my mom killed herself, I was just in this really bad place, you know, personally. So, I just thought that it would make me feel better if I wrote to Sesame Street, because they were so nice when I was a little kid. No one ever wrote back. Well, you know, a lot of those Muppets don't have thumbs. All I got was a lousy keychain. And by that time, I was living in a box. I didn't have keys. I'm sorry, Phoebes. I just, you know, I just wanted to do a good deed, like, like you did with the babies. This isn't a good deed. You just want to get on TV. This is totally selfish. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What about you having those babies for your brother? Talk about selfish. <laughs> about uh, well yeah it was a really nice thing and all but it made you feel really good right yeah so well it made you feel good so that makes it selfish look there's no unselfish good deeds sorry yes there are there are totally good deeds that are selfless uh, well may i ask for one example yeah it's you know there's no you may not <laughs> that's because all people are selfish are you calling me selfish are you calling you people? <laughs> yeah, well, sorry to burst that bubble, Phoebes, but selfless good deeds don't exist, okay? And you know the deal on Santa Claus, right? I'm gonna find a selfless good deed. I'm gonna beat you, you evil genius. <laughs> hey, Joey, when you said the deal with Santa Claus, you meant... That he doesn't exist. Right. Mm. I can't find a selfless good deed. You know that really old guy that lives next door to me? Well, I snuck over there and, and raked up all the leaves on his front stoop, but he caught me and he, like, force-fed me cider and cookies. <laughs> and then I felt wonderful. That old jackass. <laughs> Maybe Joey's right. Maybe the, all good deeds are selfish. I will find a selfless good deed, because I just gave birth to three children and I will not let them be raised in a world where Joey is right. <laughs> PBS Telethon. Hey, Joey. I just uh, wanted to let you know that I found a selfless good deed. I went down to the park and I let a bee sting me. What? What is that going to do anybody? Well, it helps the bee look tough in front of his bee friends. The bee is happy and I am definitely not. Now, you know, the bee probably died after he stung you. <laughs> PBS Telethon. Hi, Joey. Hey, Phoebes. I would like to make a pledge. I would like to donate two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars? You sure, Phoebes? I mean, after what Sesame Street did to you? Oh, I'm still mad at them. But I also know that they bring happiness to lots of kids whose moms didn't kill themselves. <laughs> you know, so by supporting them, I'm doing a good thing. But I'm not happy about it. So, there, a selfless good deed. All right, and you don't feel a little good about donating the money? No, it sucks. I was saving up to buy a hamster. A hamster? What, those things are like ten bucks? Yeah, not the one I had my eye on. It looks like we have surpassed last year's pledge total. Thank you, viewers. The pledge that did it was taken by one of our volunteers. Oh, boy. And may I say, one of our 
sharpest dressed volunteers, <laughs> Mr. Joseph Triviani. Oh, look, look, Joey's on TV. Oh, isn't that great? Hey, my pledge got Joey on TV. Oh, that makes me feel so... Oh, no! <laughs> Russ Schaefer Landau, in his introductory ethics textbook, spells out more precisely why psychological egoism would be a problem for common sense morality. So let's take a look at that argument. He calls it the implications of egoism argument. Premise one says, if psychological egoism is true, then we can't be altruistic. That seems to be an unimpeachable premise because it's just sort of the assertion of the definition of psychological egoism. It outlaws or makes altruism impossible. Premise two, if we can't be altruistic, then it can't be our duty to be altruistic. This is just the ought implies can principle. Morality can't demand things of us that are impossible. It follows logically from these two premises that if psychological egoism is true, then it can't be our duty to be altruistic. Notice how this conclusion is logically necessitated by the previous two premises. Premise four is the assertion of the truth of psychological egoism. And then the conclusion of the argument follows logically from all of the previous premises. It says, therefore, it can't be our duty to be altruistic. So the soundness of this argument seems to rest entirely on premise four, whether psychological egoism is true. And this sort of pervasive or deep threat to morality depends on the truth of psychological egoism. So we have to evaluate that premise. Now, I think psychological egoism is in fact false. And I think there are actually lots of reasons to agree with me. A careful read of Schaefer Landau's chapter on psychological egoism or Rachel's chapter on the topic should demonstrate more thoroughly why the thesis is wrong. But here, I'll compile a few of what I take to be the strongest objections to it. That is, the strongest reasons against it. For one, an act that ends up being pleasurable does not necessarily imply that it was motivated for the sake of that pleasure alone. This is the fundamental mistake in Lincoln and in Phoebe's reasoning. Feeling good about having done something good often indicates that you are a good person. You wouldn't feel good about helping others if you were truly selfish. The important point is, though, that feeling good isn't necessarily the primary aim or motivation of the action. You can primarily aim to help others for their own sake. We could explain Lincoln's behavior that way and Phoebe's behavior that way, too. Even though, as the show goes, it's a little bit more complicated than that. In any case, you can imagine it's easy to come by examples where people are not motivated for the from the pleasure that they get for helping others, but rather they're motivated directly to help those others themselves. Any feeling that accompanies that kind of aim could be secondary or even wholly irrelevant to why you performed the act. So to recap, Lincoln and Phoebe's reasoning contains a fundamental mistake. It's the assumption that feeling good if it accompanies an action is its primary motivation. Let's check out a second example or a second strong reason against psychological egoism. Some acts are very hard to explain egoistically. Ones like this. On the New York City subway, it's hard enough finding someone who will give up his seat to a stranger, let alone willing to give up his life for one. 
train was coming in like, like, like that. And it happened just. 50-year-old Wesley Autry, a construction worker and Navy veteran, was standing on a subway platform with his two little girls when right in front of them, a man started having a seizure. He kind of stumbled and over his own feet and fall backwards. I see a train coming, but the train is so close, I'm like, what do I do? Wesley jumped onto the tracks and thought if he could just lie on top of the man, keep him from flailing, maybe the train would roll right over both of them. The clearance was exactly 21 inches. Wesley and the man, 20 and a half. No way the train can stop before this gentleman could get him, get him up off the tracks. So he covered him with his body and pushed him down to a point where the train wouldn't hit his head and held him down under the tracks while the train came and rolled right over the top of him. It gave Wesley's children the scare of their young lives. I thought he was going to get killed. And Wesley, the scare of his too. I'm like talking to him, sir, you can't move. I got two kids up here looking for the father to come back. I don't know you, you don't know me, but listen, don't panic. You know, I'm here to save you. As for the guy Wesley saved, he's 20-year-old Cameron Hollipter. And other than a few scrapes and bruises, his father says he's doing fine. Mr. Autry's instinctive and unselfish act saved our son's life. You know, the word hero gets thrown around a lot nowadays. What a better way to say it to start off the new year than to save, save a life. <laughs> nice to be reminded of what one really looks like. Steve Hartman, CBS News, New York. It's extremely unlikely that Autry was motivated by selfish concern. He couldn't have reasonably expected that his chances of making it out alive were very good. That is, the chances were high that he would have had no self to be concerned about after jumping in front of the train. He was likely to die. An egoist, of course, would explain this kind of action by appeal to anticipated reward. Autry would be lauded as a hero if he succeeded. And indeed, he was lauded as a hero after his heroic act. But let's think about how plausible this egoistic explanation is. Do you really think that Autry had time to contemplate the recognition and the reward that he would get upon seeing the oncoming train? Again, if he succeeded. I doubt it. Egoists who cling to their view in these kinds of cases are like flat earthers who have an answer for every objection to their view. It's of course possible to explain everything in terms of their view. But the question is, what's the best explanation of this kind of action? And egoism just doesn't seem to be it. So I hope that you find those sorts of reasons a convincing refutation of psychological egoism. But now let's turn to a related view, ethical egoism, which is not a descriptive view, but rather it's a normative view. It's not a view about our motivations, but a view about how we should act. That's the normativity in it. Ethical egoism says that we should maximize self-interest, and that itself is the only ethical imperative. It's the only thing that we morally ought to strive for. Now, this kind of view might sound crazy at first, but it's not entirely without its attractions and unfortunately, not entirely without its supporters. Ethical egoism is a theoretically simple view, but more persuasively, it explains why we should buy into morality. Or rather, it doesn't explain it, but it confronts this question in a kind of clever way. It's important to note that this is an age-old philosophical problem. Why should we be moral? 
That's been asked since the time of Plato. Ethical egoism has a nice way of dealing with this question. Nearly all of us care about ourselves. Insofar as you get out of bed in the morning and eat something, you are already bought in to some things being valuable, at least for you. Insofar as you're having a philosophy discussion about this topic, you're already bought in to some things being valuable. So egoism sort of sidesteps this difficult and age-old philosophical problem. By buying into your own self-preservation, by investing in your future to some degree, you are already bought into morality. Again, if morality consists entirely of the egoist's picture. The proponent of egoism can make this interesting philosophical move with every interlocutor or conversation partner she has, since they'll presumably have fed themselves and slept and taken enough care of themselves to have gotten to the conversation. So it's a nice sort of dialectical move. You might also think that the success of capitalism as an economic system lends some support to the view. Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand of free market economics. If we all act in our own self-interest in accordance with a system of private property and free and fair exchange, we can make everyone, or nearly everyone, somewhat better off. Smith put it this way, quote, Every individual neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own security, and by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which has no part of his intention. Supporters of ethical egoism have actually penetrated our culture, and in some cases pretty pervasively. Ayn Rand, a famous novelist, wrote two very influential books, the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, published in 1943 and 1957, respectively. These books have garnered a lot of interest and some very large followings. Many Republican politicians, such as Paul Ryan and Ron Paul, have claimed Rand as a primary influence on their political thought. Economist and former chair of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, was actually a close associate of Rand, being a part of her innermost social circle. He read Atlas Shrugged while it was being written. And Ron Paul's son, Rand Paul, a Kentucky senator, is actually named after Ayn Rand. There's in fact an entire Wikipedia article that lists individuals influenced by her. Now, it's not easy to discern from Rand's works of fiction alone that she's an ethical egoist. The characters in her novels who are meant to illustrate her philosophy are individualistic, but they don't seem to be pursuing solely their own self-interest. So these politicians might not be out-and-out out ethical egoists themselves. Nevertheless, Rand affirmed her commitment to ethical egoism in her nonfiction works. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, an authoritative source on contemporary philosophical research that you should definitely check out, says that, quote, all three of Rand's ethical views are, of course, egoist, in that the primary or sole intended beneficiary of morality is supposed to be the moral agent herself. 
I think ethical egoism, like psychological egoism, is wrong. And in the remainder of the video, I'm going to discuss what I take to be the strongest objection to it. The objection boils down to this. Why should your own perspective or your own well-being be privileged? What non-arbitrary reason can we find for the kind of priority that ethical egoism puts on the individual? As James Rachels points out in his textbook, there are lots of moral theories that prioritize one group or individual over another. Racism is a great example. For no good reason, racists believe that their race should be morally prioritized over other races. But this is a completely arbitrary kind of prioritization. What does the color of your skin have to do with what ought to matter morally? Nothing. It's exactly like prioritizing people who have red hair or brown eyes. Those kinds of traits would be an entirely arbitrary basis for a moral preference of one group over others. In a similar kind of way, a prioritization of one's own well-being seems arbitrary. Imagine that you and a friend were on a hiking trip. There's only one sandwich left, but both of you are very hungry. You shout to your friend, I should get the sandwich because I'm me. That wouldn't make any sense and would hardly serve as a reason at all for you to get the sandwich. Non-arbitrary considerations would include things like who made the sandwiches, who needs the sandwich in order to finish the hike, and would it be possible to potentially split the sandwich? The problem is that ethical egoism seems to have an arbitrary basis, much like racism. A final example will help demonstrate this point. In game theory, which is the study of the interactions and outcomes of mathematically modeled rational decision makers, there's a situation called the prisoner's dilemma, where rational actors who choose to act entirely out of self-interest actually end up worse off than they would in the alternative in which they cooperated, acting not entirely out of self-interest. There are lots of cases like this where acting in one's own rational self-interest makes everyone worse off. Here's a clip that will help explain the prisoner's dilemma. Let's say Mr. Blue and Miss Red have each been arrested for some minor crime. The police think they committed a more serious crime, but they don't have enough evidence to convict them. They need a confession. They take them and put them in separate rooms so they can't talk and play a little game. To try to force a confession, the police give them each a choice. Admit your partner committed the crime and you will go free. We'll pardon you for the minor crime, but your partner will have to spend three years in prison. If you stay silent and your partner lets us know that you were the one who really did it, then you're gonna have to go away for three years. They know that the police don't have any evidence, and if they both stay silent, then they will only go to prison one year each for the minor crime. If they both betray each other, then they'll both go to prison for two years each. Okay, each partner can do one of two things, stay silent or betray. Staying silent would be cooperating and betraying would be defecting. If they both stay silent, then they each spend a year in prison. If one betrays and the other stays silent, then the betrayer goes free and the silent spends three years in prison. If they both betray, then it's two years each. So what are they going to do? Well, they should cooperate. That's the best option for the group, if we add the total number of years in prison. But let's take it from Red's perspective. If she thinks Blue is going to stay silent, then she should betray so she can go free. Going free is better than spending a year in prison. If she thinks he's going to betray her, then she should definitely betray. Two years in jail is better than three and being made a fool of. Blue is in the exact same situation and will think the exact same thing. He should betray if she stays silent and he should betray if she betrays. They should have both 
both cooperated, but from an individual standpoint, they noticed they could always gain by defecting, if they have no control over what the other person's going to do. So they'll both defect to try to better their own situation, but come away not only hurting the group, but themselves. Individually, they're worse off than if they both cooperated. This situation is pretty made up, but it has some real-world analogs. A common example is with marketing. Let's say two cigarette companies, Red Strikes and Smooth Blue, are deciding how much money they should spend on advertising. Since the product they each make is identical to one another, advertising has a huge impact on sales. For simplicity, let's say their choices are to advertise a bunch or not advertise at all. And there's just 100 people in this society and they all smoke. If both don't advertise, then just by random chance picking cigarette boxes, 50 people buy Red Strikes and 50 people buy Smooth Blue. At $2 a pack, they each make $100. Let's say advertising costs $30. If one person advertises and the other does not, then 80 people will buy the cigarettes from the ads and 20 people buy the other ones. The advertiser makes $160 minus $30 for ads and comes away with $130. The non-advertiser didn't spend any money but only made $40. If they both advertise, again half will buy Red Strikes and half will buy Smooth Blue. But since they both spent $30 on advertising, they only come away with $70 each. Same deal, both people cooperating and not advertising is the most preferable situation. But both companies can see that advertising will always make them more money. But unlike the prisoners in jail, these companies can talk and try to influence each other. From here, Blue would be better off if Red didn't advertise. Red wouldn't go for that because that would be worse for them. Blue could try to convince Red that they would both not advertise, the only other situation where they're both better off. But without any real obligation to each other, there's nothing that's stopping them from trying to advertise to gain more of the market anyway. If you think your opponent's gonna not advertise, then you're better off advertising. Although, we're still making assumptions to make this situation work too. With this model, we're assuming they only play once. The game changes when the players have a chance to build a relationship and work together to get more gains over time, or punish each other by not cooperating. Also, to make the model work, we have to make up rules for the players. Assume they're basically computer programs with predictable actions. These guys are creepier than they were in my head. They were supposed to be cute. For the prisoner's dilemma and other similar models, we're assuming they are rational agents. A rational agent is a hypothetical person that will always pick the option that they predict will work out best for them. They're not really thinking about the gains of someone else. Seems selfish, but it is something that real people generally do too. People always want what's best for themselves, and we don't like to be made a fool of. But if you put real people in the prisoner's dilemma, people don't always defect like the model predicts. In one study, 40 people playing prisoner's dilemma games through a computer without ever meeting or talking, only playing each opponent once, these are one-off games, using a payoff matrix that looks like this, cooperated an average of 22% of the time. These people never cooperated, these people always cooperated, these guys cooperated on half of their games and everyone else is in between. This is a lot of cooperation coming from a model that predicts no cooperation. Cooperation. The largest group did act like rational agents, but most people tried to cooperate at least once. It's because, well, there's more to real people. We are social creatures, and even in one-off scenarios with no guarantees or obligations and no chance to build a relationship, we're still thinking about how the group might decide. We're actually thinking from the perspective of the group and making an optimistic decision. Cooperating an average of 20% of the time might not seem very optimistic, but remember this is with absolutely no communication or obligations. Anyways, that's not really the point. Using rational agents is still useful. The model is just trying to point out the dilemma of certain situations where people are actually hurting themselves when counterintuitively they're only thinking about themselves. And that's why we're modeling using the cold robotic psychopaths. So let's go through that one more time just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Prisoner A and prisoner B can each either confess to a crime by defecting or betraying the other prisoner or remain silent by cooperating with the other prisoner. If both of them remain silent, cooperating, they both get one year of prison. If both defect, betraying one another, they both get two years. If one confesses, betraying the other, defecting, and the other remains silent, however, the one who defects gets to go free, and the other gets three years. 
the scenario can be re represented as such. See this graphic here. And feel free to pause the video to take a careful look at it. Now, each prisoner thinking completely in terms of his rational, individual self-interest should reason like this. No matter what, I should confess betraying my comrade. Here's why. No matter what he does, I'll be better off this way. If I defect and he stays silent, I get to go free, as opposed to getting one year. If I defect and he defects, then I get two years, which is better than three years, what I'd get if I cooperated. So since getting off free is better than one year in prison, and two years in prison is better than three years, I should defect. I'm better off that way no matter what my comrade does. Here's the problem with that line of reasoning. Even though its logic is perfect, and it is the most rational thing to do from the individual's perspective, it will lead to a worse outcome, collectively speaking. If both prisoners choose to reason this way, then both will serve two years as opposed to one, which would be the outcome if they chose to go against their rational self-interest. So by cooperating, everyone would be better off. And there are lots of real world examples that conform to this structure, like the choice to drive to work as opposed to taking the bus in a crowded city. If we all took the bus, we'd all be better off because there'd be less traffic and less pollution. But if we all drive doing the individually rational thing, then there'll be a lot of pollution and a lot more traffic. So there are lots of cases where we should want to cooperate so we can all be better off acting against our individual self-interest. And there's a strong intuition here, or at least I have a strong intuition, that the perspective of everyone involved matters. We should look at things from the point of view of the universe, as Henry Sidgwick once put it. We should worry about overall well-being, not just the well-being of one person. And if that's right, then ethical egoism is refuted. I hope you enjoyed this lecture on Philosophy Jam. Please check out the discussion questions and spend time thinking and answering them. And I'll see you next time on Philosophy Jam. Bye.